Hello, everyone. Welcome to this monthly webinar on the Southwest Drought Conditions and Resources. My name is Joel Lisenby. I'm a Regional Drought Information Coordinator at the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. If you are not familiar with NIDIS, you can learn more about us at drought.gov, and there's a lot of other really cool things you can check out there, too. For those of you who are familiar with this webinar series, we usually try to keep these briefings short to about half an hour. They're casual conversations that will highlight the current state of drought across the Southwest, and also highlight some of the great work happening across the region right now to help build resilience to drought conditions here. These monthly 30-minute briefings began during the 2020 Southwest Drought as part of the Southwest Drought Learning Network's Drought Monitoring and Reporting Team. And these will continue as long as there is interest in this type of information and this format. I'd like to acknowledge a few people who are primary co-organizers of these webinars and they do a lot of work to make these happen every month. These are Emily Elias, the director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub, Gretel Fallingstad, who's also uh, here at NIDIS. Uh, she's a drought information coordinator with me here, and also Curtis Reganti from the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. The Drought Learning Network aims to support peer-to-peer -peer learning by linking climate service providers with resource managers and resource managers with one another to share ideas and information that will increase landscape and community resilience in current and future drought. Um, if you'd like to be part of the Drought Learning Network and attend future meetings, reach out to uh, either me responding to the emails that sent you the, the um, notification for this webinar or Emily Elias, and we can get you connected with that network. Now, before we get into the webinar, I want to go through a few quick webinar logistics. These are all sort of the standard ones that most of us have seen by now. For this webinar, everybody is muted, and this webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be made available from the NIDIS YouTube channel and at drought.gov slash webinars, and that should be online later this week. The format of today's webinar will be a presentation by each of our invited experts, followed by a time for questions at the end. The questions today will be moderated by my colleague, Gretel Fallingstad. If you would like to ask questions, you may do so at any time by typing your question into the question box in GoToWebinar. And also when you log off of this webinar at the end, you'll be invited to take a short survey. If you have a project that's designed to help build drought resilience in the Southwest United States that you would like to present at future webinars, please add that as a comment in the survey when you leave the webinar. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. First, we'll hear from Dave Simmerall. Dave is an associate research climatologist at the Desert Research Institute and Western Regional Climate Center in Reno, Nevada. And he's also been an author of the US Drought Monitor since 2012. Immediately following Dave, we'll hear from Michelle Stokes, who has been the hydrologist in charge at NOAA's National Weather Service Colorado Basin River Forecast Center in Salt Lake City since, 20, uh, since 2006. The Colorado Basin River Forecast Center is an operational office which produces river and water supply forecasts for over 400 locations across the Colorado River Basin and Eastern Great Basin. These forecasts are used for flood warning, recreational purposes, water management, and to make highly valuable water resource decisions in a water scarce part of the country. So with that introduction, I'll now pass over to Dave to tell us what's going on with our climate. Okay, thanks, Joel. Let me get connected here. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. It looks like you're not quite in presentation mode yet, yeah. but we can see your slides. Okay, how does that look? It looks great. Okay, get started. Okay, first I want to start out talking about just the current drought status. So I have two mirror images, different dates. On the left is the uh, drought monitor map from the beginning of the water year. So that's about October 1st. And uh, as you can see, I've highlighted uh, the states that are covered in this presentation. But you can see across the Western US, we we're about 73% drought total regionally. Um, the numbers that I put superimposed on top of each of the states are the percentage of drought um, that 
uh, drought coverage within the respective states on October 1st. So you could see um, we had Nevada, Utah, 100% in drought, uh, New Mexico, 77%, little lower percentages in Colorado and uh, Arizona. On the right is the latest map, which I had authored, uh, and you can see a substantial decrease in the drought coverage across the western U.S. Um, on the right side, you can see a table. Uh, the current coverage for the western U.S. is uh, 27% as a region, again, as compared to 73% uh, beginning of the water year. And a year ago, uh, same date, as you can see at the bottom of the table, where I have the red uh, outline on it. I don't know if you could see my cursor. Uh, but that was 90% in drought. And just to give you a, a feel for how much has changed, this is uh, a change map in the upper right corner. And the cool colors represent uh, improvements in drought categories. So you can see um, across most of the region, Southwest region, we've had uh, multiple class, and in some cases, five uh, class improvements uh, as uh, in, Southeastern Colorado, we've had some degradations in those areas. So how do we get there? Uh, this is looking at the precipitation for the water year. Uh, these are, this is uh, part of the Westwide Drought Tracker uh, products, our, our new one that just released recently. And this is looking on the left-hand side is the percentage of average for uh, the water year. So this is starting uh, beginning of October. And this is through the end of, of March because this is a monthly product that just comes out once a month. And as you can see, uh, the cooler colors, the, the greens and uh, the darker, deeper greens um, are areas with above normal precip, areas that are white are near normal, and the warmer colors represent below normal uh, precipitation. And as you can see, uh, the percentages of normal were really uh, very high in areas, especially in areas of the, uh, the Great Basin, as well as areas of Utah and northern Arizona, eastern portions or western portions of uh, both Colorado as well as New Mexico. Um, some contextual information, the image on the right is the same time period, but this is the percentile rankings and where the total amount of precipitation for a given area uh, ranks in terms of the longer term historical record. So you can see the really deep green colors. Those are areas with uh, record wetness. So you can see those across the Western Great Basin, as well as the central and uh, Eastern portions of the Great Basin, as well as areas of Utah, including kind of the Eastern portions, and then across the region in general, you know, most of the region was in the, you know, range from the top uh, 10th percentile to, or the top 10th percentile to the top 33rd percentile. Uh, the only areas lagging behind were generally speaking in that southwestern portion of Colorado. Taking a look at uh, temperatures, uh, same period of time on the left. This is for the water year, uh, October through March. And again, you can see the cooler colors representing uh, uh, record coldness. Uh, so you can see those are the record coldest where the deepest blue colors are uh, across the region. So we've had obviously a very cool uh, winter in association uh, with the La Nina, La Nina cycle we were in. On the right, I just chose March because uh, I wanted folks to get a, an idea of the temperatures, uh, you know, looking, you know, moving into the spring months when runoff is occurring. And over the last several seasons, we've had uh, rather warm temperatures uh, moving into the spring months in late spring, uh, which has been detrimental for uh, the runoff season. We've had a number of heat waves past uh, several spring times that have uh, uh, not been good in terms of runoff. So this is really nice. We've had some nice uniform, cool, cooler than normal temperatures across the region, uh, which is gonna help the snowpack hang around and we're gonna get 
uh, nice um, runoff uh, steadily occurring. Hopefully we're not gonna heat up too much moving forward in the late spring. So taking a look at the current uh, snowpack conditions, on the left-hand side, this was the uh, latest snow water equivalent percentiles uh, for the region. And you can see uh, very high percentiles. A lot of them are you know, in the 100th uh, percentile range. Uh, so all the war or the cool colors uh, are representing uh, basically in the top, you know, say 10th percentile. And then you can see we've got some areas in Colorado kind of, uh, you know, spanning from, you know, about the level of Leadville, you know, up in the like Summit County and part of the Front Range where we've had some below normal uh, snow water equivalent numbers at snow tell stations, as well as down in the Sangre de Cristo range in Southwest and South Central Colorado as well. On the right, these are the percentage of median uh, for snow water equivalent. Again, all these nice cool colors uh, representing above normal SWE numbers. These are the individual uh, drainage basins that are labeled as well as the percent of median. And this is on April 1st, uh, which is uh, an important number at looking at the snowpack. And again, in that, uh, you know, eastern portions of Colorado, a little bit lower uh, percentages. Now, the actual numbers of SWE have gone down a little bit uh, since April 1st in some areas, and I have those listed across the bottom, but as you can see, the, the Arkansas drainage is down to about 85% of medium for the date. I just wanted to highlight um, a couple areas. One is uh, the state of Utah. So this is, uh, this is looking at all the snow tell stations across the state of Utah and, uh, and it's averaged over that area. And basically from left to right, this is a basically the evolution of the snow water equivalent as the season moves by. So on the, on the left-hand side, on the x-axis, um, you can see uh, that's October 1st, and this is, you can see the individual storms as it inches up. Uh, so you can see on the top where labeled 2022-23, that is where Utah's snowpack is now. Right below that was the record prior to that. So you can see how far above uh, the highest snowpack uh, that the state of Utah has had, as opposed to the median number, which is where that green X's, that is the median where the snowpack's generally at its peak, and that's about April 3rd, and you can see where we're at now. So that's really good shape for Utah. As put, and I wanted to give you some context in uh, the state of the, the current drought, uh, you can see the two seasons prior to that, how low the snowpack uh, was in terms of below the median, and in that yellow area, um, that's getting into uh, the bottom, uh, basically a low, the bottom 30th percentile range. So looking at uh, some other interesting things, this is uh, on the left-hand side, this is SWE on April 1st. And these are, these are records that for the period of record uh, for the individual snow tell stations across the region. So as you can see on the bottom left, if it's the dot is blue, that is the highest snow water equivalent for that given snow tell station uh, for that date on April 1st. So you can see we've got them in the, you know, uh, in the Nevada side of uh, kind of over at Lake Tahoe area, we've got uh, records across areas of the Rubies and the in the Great Basin Range. Uh, also in uh, a number of records in the Wasatch uh, Range as well, as well as in eastern and the western edges of the Uinta Mountains, uh, air also down in northern Arizona on the southern Colorado Plateau and areas of the San Juan Mountains in southwest Colorado as well. So you can see uh, we have some really excellent snowpack uh, conditions on April 1st 
uh, across the region. And and the green the green ones are second highest on record. And I most of you have probably heard this, but I just want to put some uh, snowfall totals, season totals, and you can see those in the bottom right. Um, and I've got arrows pointing to those locations. If you're not familiar with where those ski areas are, but you can see uh, places like Alta had 73 feet of snow that uh, fell this year. Pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, looking at the uh, current stream flows and soil moisture uh, within the region, on the left we have the real-time flows, and you can see the cool colors are all running above normal. I've got some red circles highlighting areas where we have some current flooding going on, which is going to be a concern in some areas as the snow starts to melt, temperatures warm up. Uh, so one is in the East Walker River Basin in Western Nevada. We've got some up on the Humboldt uh, River in Northern Nevada and the Jemez River in Northern uh, New Mexico. But uh, you should see we're gonna, these stream flows are gonna pick up as uh, you know these cooler temperatures start to abate and things warm up. Uh, on the right, you can see this is a soil moisture uh, uh, percentiles and the blue areas are areas that are uh, really good soil moisture conditions. And I've highlighted some areas that have some uh, below normal uh, soil moisture conditions at present. Looking at reservoir storage, this is only through the end of March on the left hand side, and each dot represents a reservoir. And you can see the uh, number of reservoirs that are below normal. Uh, these are going to pick up. These numbers are going to improve as uh, we start getting into kind of the peak runoff season. And on the right, uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the, the big reservoirs, Mead and Powell, and the condition they're in. And I, I think Michelle will probably be covering that further in her presentation. Uh, Going ahead, looking at the outlooks, uh, we're currently, we've transitioned into ENSO neutral uh, conditions, uh, sea surface temperature anomalies and, uh, are moved into the positive range um, across the uh, equatorial central and eastern Pacific with some particularly warm uh, anomalies in ENSO 1 plus 2 on the uh, on the far eastern edge, as you can see right off the coast of uh, South America. And those are the anomalies listed on there, you can see. And on the bottom right is the latest uh, IRI plume. So basically each one of these uh, represents a differing uh, dynamic model and statistical models. And these are looking at predictions in terms of sea surface temperature uh, anomalies moving forward. Uh, you can see where I have a box around it, that's the latest uh, area of where we're at now. And you can see moving into, uh, moving into the summer months, you can see the um, JJA, you can see there's fairly good agreement that most of the models are pointing towards a transition into El Nino conditions um, by by about the June through April or August time period. And looking ahead at the outlooks in terms of the monthly uh, outlooks on your left, we have uh, and seasonal outlooks. Uh, on the left hand side, those are the temperature outlooks moving forward, and uh, we're still in uh, kind of that cool mode in the western U.S. Uh, we just got some snow in Reno this morning, uh, actually. And uh, so we're predicted to uh, stay in that pattern through the end of the month. Uh, moving into the April, May, June time frame, frame we should get some warming in the uh, kind of southern tier of the region. Uh, and much of the region uh, is going to be equal chances with uh, some below normal temperatures expected in the northern Great Basin. and uh, uh, Great Basin, uh, Eastern Great Basin in Utah, as well as kind of the Wasatch, Uinta Mountains area. Uh, looking at the monthly precip outlooks, uh, you can see below normal precip is expected in uh, Arizona and uh, parts of New Mexico, uh, and little wetter conditions in northern portions of 
Nevada and Utah. Uh, looking forward in the seasonal uh, precipitation, I'll look below normal expected in the southern tier of the region. And moving on to the seasonal drought outlook, uh, this is where we're expecting uh, the drought conditions to be moving forward uh, with some improvement expected across uh, drought affected areas within the Great Basin, uh, Utah, and uh, some portions of Colorado and some degradation expected in eastern portions of Colorado, New Mexico, um, as well as southern portions of Utah and uh, Nevada. And that will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. I'm going to pass over now to Michelle. Uh, Michelle, I'm giving you presenter permissions now. You and when you get that, you can just go ahead. Hi everyone, can you see my screen okay? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. All right. All right. So uh, let me just give you a quick background who we are. So the NOAA's National Weather Service has 13 river forecast centers around the country, and ours is the Colorado Basin. We do the Colorado Basin and Eastern Great Basin. All these blue dots that you see on this map are locations for which we provide 10-day forecasts, like you see on the bottom right side, um, and we do that every day. The, the map will light up like it's lit up today at locations that are giving uh, some action, either close to action stage or flood stage. And, that's updated uh, continuously. In the Western United States, there's an, and all the RFCs do that. And in the Western United States, the RFCs also do water supply forecasts. These are all the locations that we provide water supply forecasts in the Weather Service. As you see, there's a lot of deep blue, which is over 100, 150% of normal in uh, all of the West. And I'll go into a little more detail for the Colorado Basin. Uh, Water supply forecasts are basically a probabilistic volumetric forecast, and it's in Upper Colorado, it's mostly from April to July, the runoff period of how much water we're expecting to get into the rivers. They're unregulated forecasts, and they, you know, they account for current stream flow conditions, what's going on with the snow, soil moisture conditions. So let's focus in on the Colorado Basin. So we've had and Dave talked about this a lot, so maybe I shouldn't spend too much time on this, but very good precipitation over the winter, mostly due to atmospheric rivers. Um, this is in the middle uh, water year to date precipitation through yesterday. Most of the Colorado Basin was, has received over 150% of average across uh, the area. And I uh, put on the NRCS no-tell stations on the right side here that Dave also showed. You know, same same kind of message, 150% uh, of median in most areas, and a lot of these locations are records for, for their period of record. We've also had colder temperatures, which, you know, uh, added snow to the snowpack and minimal, uh, uh, minimal snow melt, although it started to melt since April 1st. So this is uh, the locations in our area. Um, this is our forecast range. These are percent of the 1991 through 2020 median. All the purples are 200% or more of uh, that percent of average. Uh, the only areas that are you know, near normal basically are the upper, upper head, headwaters of the upper Colorado and the upper parts of the Green River Basin. Here are some ranges just to give you an idea. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the upper Colorado, but basically anywhere between 90 and 305% of normal. And down in Arizona, because flows are you know, smaller, you get these really big numbers, which is kind of fun to see this year. Um, and you can see the ranges here, anywhere from 210% to 635%, 710% even in Arizona. I'm gonna dive into the upper Colorado a little bit more. Um, these are the forecasts that we issued on April 1st for those areas. Uh, the upper green, 95 to 140 to 45% of normal, and then 
the Duchesne really high, 140 to 260. Same with the San Rafael Kinder's Devil really high, 150 to 305% of normal. Uh, the White and the Yampa, and you see here the Gunnison, Dolores, San Juan, all the numbers there. All these come into Lake Powell, which is considered, you know, it summarizes basically what's going on through the upper Colorado basin. And our forecast there is 177% of normal as of April 1st. So for all these, all our lo the locations on the map that I showed previously, you can you can click on the location and get you know deep dig deep deeper into what the forecast is showing. These are what we call evolution plots, which basically show how our forecast has evolved over time. We started issuing forecasts here in mid December. The blue shaded area is what the model is showing. The pink bars that you're seeing are our official forecast that the Forecaster sometimes adjusts, um, maybe not so much, but uh, anyway, that's what it shows. Uh, the 50% is basically there's a 50% chance of being above or below the volume that's shown here. Um, the 90% is a 90% chance of being exceeded. So this would be basically what would happen if we had a drier spring from now on. And on the upper end here, you have uh, the volume that has a 10% chance of being exceeded. But keep in mind, you know, there's still a 20% chance that the observed runoff could be outside of this range that, that is shown here. So the official forecast uh, on April 1st was 11.3 um, million acre feet for Lake Powell inflow. And you can see how things have evolved since April 1st. If you're curious about that, our, you know, our model kind of showed a dip maybe a week ago, and now it's back up to about where it was at the beginning of the month. You can find this information for any location you're interested in on our webpage. So this is all good news. Lots of water, um, high uh, water supply forecasts are high, which is good news, but the flip side is that this is also going to elevate the risk of flooding in the basin. Um, so because of that, we've kind of spiffed up our, flood, our peak flow forecast information on our web page. And um, I'm not going to go into that too much because we're running out of time, but you basically have a lot more information to give you an idea of what the peak flow is expected to be uh, this runoff season. And that's all I have. Maybe I'll mention, maybe I'll mention the black locations are, we're expecting the highest peak that we've seen for that period of record for that individual point. And dark blue or 90, in the 90th percentile. And that's all. Thank you, Michelle. I'll now pass over to Gretel to moderate the questions. Thank you so much, Joel. And thank you to Dave and Michelle for a really great and informative presentations. We do have two questions. Um, they were both came in for Dave's presentation. And the first one was, why are there no error bars um, on the SWE graphs? Error bars on the Utah SWE graph? But they, they did give as an example for the Utah SWE. Um, those are actual numbers, they're not forecasts. So that's just tracking the actual observation at each day moving through the water year. So I'm I'm not exactly sure uh what uh what error uh might be in terms of that. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically a data report out versus a modeling. Yeah, report correct. Um, and the next question, uh, Dave, was about soil moisture and how it is measured or simulated into, um, and I'm not sure if they meant into the drought monitor or into um, the other portion of your report out. Yeah, so we, I, I chose one particular, uh, that's the NASA Sport product, but we, at the drought monitor, we do look at uh, differing percentile rankings of soil moisture from uh, various, we look at NLDAS Ensemble, which is a, a mix of uh, a variety of differing soil moisture models, 
and we have a couple other satellite based models which can integrate uh, observational data uh, as well as, as some model data uh, as well into those. Uh, some of them kind of, I'd like to look at a variety of them um, because sometimes you'll see a fair amount of uh, deviation for a particular location between differing soil moisture models. Uh, but uh, it is one of the uh, parameters that we do use to take a look at uh, uh, you know the conditions in terms of uh, this year we've seen you can see good agreement between areas with above normal soil moisture and areas where uh, the snowpack was above normal. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we are about out of time. Uh, Joel, should we go for one more question, or should we? Yep, we can go till uh, till 1:35 Mountain Time. We've okay, got about great. Four minutes. Excellent. So this question, I believe, is for Michelle, and the question is for water supply forecasts. How is consumption accounted for locations lower in the basin, like for Lake Powell? I didn't hear the first word, but it was that. Can you just repeat the first word? I couldn't hear. Yeah, it was for the water supply forecasts. How is yeah. accounted for for locations lower in the basin, like Lake Powell? Um, okay. So oh. our our forecasts are unregulated, so we take out any kind of regulation that we're aware of and diversions so that the flow that we are providing is an unregulated flow. Um, there are some diversions that we don't know about, so those are kind of in there and they're just part of the forecast, I guess. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Okay. And then one last question is the a question about what is the period of record? How far back do records go? And that probably could go to both of you. So, for example, on this, um, the last map I showed, it just depends on how, when the gauge was put into place. So some gauges have only been there for 10, 20 years. Others have been there for, you know, 100 years or so. But when we're talking about water supply percent of normal, we're using the 1991 through 2020 period of record. Excellent. Thank you. Dave, did you have anything to add for your presentation there? Yeah, it, it kind of depends. The period of record depends on the product we are looking at. You know, looking at some of the snow tell sites, um, those can go back as far as into the 1980s. Um, there have been a number of newer stations that have come out, but most of the ones that we have percentile rankings, I don't know what their threshold is for mapping it, but if they're, I think if they're less than 10 years or uh, something like that, that they will not give you an actual percentile number. So what's reported on there are the ones with the longer term records. As far as the, uh, like the precipitation products that I showed you earlier, um, as well as the temperature ones, um, those are based on uh, PRISM, which is a, a gridded data set. And those are based on uh, period of record uh, going back 1895 through 2023, essentially. And uh, some of those obviously are interpolated and calculated based on, you know, the areas in between are, uh, in between observational stations are uh, interpolated. So yeah, those, those go back pretty far. Excellent. And that's just for the rankings, for doing percentile rankings. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you both again. Very informative. Um, and we very much appreciate both of you presenting today. Joel, back to you. Thank you, Gretel. Thank you, Dave and Michelle. Uh, we appreciate you taking your time and expertise to share that information with us. Uh, we look forward to all of you joining us next month when we do all of this again. And that concludes today's webinar.